Well, it is good to be here, and I just want, I'm excited um, to uh, keep going in our series, Defiant Joy. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and get them out. We're going to continue in Philippians chapter 2. Ah, a little parched this morning, sorry. No, uh, Philippians chapter 2, and I was thinking about it as I read the story. How, how, many, uh, how many of you in the room have kids or grandkids? Anybody? Anybody? A couple of us? Some of y'all are lying because you ain't got your hands, or maybe you're just not paying attention, I'm not sure. <clears throat> So I love my kids. I got great kids. And I'm excited today also that, that I've got a couple people who are special to us here. One, my, my mother-in-law, Sherry, is here this morning. And uh, excited to have her here and to get to meet you and to know what, where we are. And we also have my niece, Eden, here. Eden's here as well. They came in. And so... Um, so that so my our front my front row squad here this morning is family. They're ready to go. But I was just thinking about because I, I love I love my kids. I, I got great kids. But can I tell you something else? I love having nights away for my kids. It's nothing about it's nothing wrong with them. I just like having time with my wife. My wife is awesome. I love having time with her. But you know when I when my kids were younger. Uh, we didn't, we, most of the time where we lived, we didn't have family close. So if we wanted to have a date night, we had to get a babysitter. And how many you know babysitters are, can, can be, can be difficult to find the right one to find ones who that you like, that your kids like, that don't string your kids up by their finger, ta- finger tail or whatever, you know, th- 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 they like your kids. And, and I remember, you know, you would go and you'd enjoy, but especially that first date night that you have and, and with that babysitter at the house. You're enjoying your time, but you're also a little apprehensive. You might not say it out loud, but you're just kind of wondering, okay, please, God, let everything go okay. We really want this one to work out. You know, you're just thinking this in the back of your mind. And when you finally get home, you've enjoyed the date night, you get there, and, and you're just so, you're, you're just like, okay, how, I wonder how the house looks. Uh, is everything together? You know, our, our, our kids, uh, did she lock them in their rooms, tell them not to come out? What happened? Or did they lock the babysitter under the stairs? That never happened. Well, maybe, anyways, um, <laughs> you look and you almost kind of peek around the door the first time and you're hoping beyond hope that everything's okay. You know, and you probably don't say it out loud, right? But, or maybe you did. Maybe before you left the house, you told the kids, y'all better act right. You better not make me, you better, you know, you better act better than you do usually when I'm home, you know? And, and, and so you get there and you're talking with the babysitter and you're like, hey, how'd it go? Did everything go okay? And, and you love hearing, oh, your kids are angels, you know, whether they're lying to you or not, whichever it is, you're just, you just kind of breathe that sigh of relief. It's kind of, oh, all right. And you think, well, what does that have to do with anything? It goes right into today's message. Because Paul, we started out last week in chapter 2. And Paul, uh, you know, I, how many, we, I love reading the Bible when I get to read the stories about Bible heroes and how they've like, and how God used them to do things and walls fell and waters parted. But when the Bible starts getting up into my business, it gets a little uncomfortable uh, uh, Marie last week came to me after service and goes, Pastor, you didn't tell me I needed my steel toe boots on this morning. She said, you see the, chip paint, the, the paint chipped off of my toes this morning. You didn't tell me you'd be stepping on toes today, Pastor. But sometimes the Bible, and when we read that, there is correction for us because we have a God who loves us. And, and, and last, week's, last week we started on this message, on this mindset of submission. And we don't like that word. It is not a word our culture thrives on because why the majority of people and our actions are all about what can I get for me? And Jesus said, actually, if you're a follow, if you're one of my followers, it's not about you. And that's difficult. And we kind of fight this. And, and so Paul started to say, he said last, you know, as we read through last week, he said, stop acting like a little kid. And start doing what you're supposed to do. Get along with people. Be united. Submit not to your will, but to mine. And Paul goes on to say, and if you question or if you wonder why you should do it, let me give you the example of Jesus. 
And we saw that. And man, it was just kind of poking. It's like, oh, that's, that's not comfortable. But it's not about being comfortable. Sundays, being a part of the body of Christ is about, is, it's, it's his body, not ours. And, and, and so there's moments. And so today we're going to kind of push in a little bit further today. So again, Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 12. And so if you've got it, if you go ahead and stand with me this morning as we re- read our primary text, be awesome. <laughs> If you're able to, stand with us. We're going to read starting in verse 12 together. If you don't have it, uh, it's on the screen. And you, hopefully you also were able to see the QR code or the link so that you could um, join us with the notes there as well. But starting in verse 12, Paul's writing. He says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share your joy. Let's pray together this morning. God, we thank you that even in moments where we we may be uncomfortable, God, even in moments where might point things out in our lives, you do it to correct us because you love us. And so today, God, as we're we're trying to, again, understand and and see what Paul was saying, what defiant joy looks like, God, help us today to, to, to not just hear it, but to understand and to apply. We love you and we trust you. In your name we pray. Everybody said amen. You can be seated this morning you can be seated. I want to go ahead right now and give you the big so what today. I like, I like every, I want, if you, I give you this, I give this idea and I learned this from one of my, from, from one of my mentors, but it's, it's like, okay, if you don't remember anything else, if there's one thing I wanted you to remember is this, and our big so what today is really simple. It's obedience leads to joy. Obedience leads to joy. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not really a, a, a theme that you hear very often today. And people are always looking for, for happiness, the pursuit of happiness, right? We're looking for that. And where, how, where do people look for that? Well, we look for it with money or with stuff. But never this idea of obedience. Never that idea. But I think it's important. I think Paul puts it here for a reason. And I think this actually, even beyond joy, I think Paul and Jesus both point to the fact that obedience leads to even more than joy. I think, I think obedience leads to life. And, and, and I think that's an important concept. And, and Paul t- wrote it here, but Jesus also talked about this. In fact, uh, in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 10, there's a story that we'll read uh, from the rich young ruler. This story, you've probably heard it before. But, or you've read it before, but at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in all three of those Gospels, we read this. But there's a story called The Rich Young Ruler. In fact, you can follow along with me on the screen or in your Bible. But this is the way it's written in the Gospel of Mark, starting in verse 17. He says, As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him. He knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asks. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone and honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. And looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. He said, there's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. And at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many 
many possessions. Uh, to paraphrase, this guy comes up to Jesus, seems to be a good guy, right? He, he walks up and he says, Jesus, Jesus. He understands that Jesus is more than just an okay guy. Like he has either observed Jesus, he's observed his, his work, the miracles, whatever else. He knows that Jesus has something. And he goes, Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? So Jesus says, what do you say? Obey the commandments. He's like, you, you, know, you know what it is. And he goes, listen, listen, Jesus, I've done all those things. I, I got it. And Jesus said, okay, there's one more thing. He says, sell everything you have. Give it away and come follow me. And at that, it says again, verse 22 says, the man's face fell and he walked away. In verse 23, of course, we read it and said, said Jesus said, okay, wait, 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 wait. You did 90% of the work, so 90% is good enough, right? It says Jesus let him go. Jesus didn't chase him down. And I want to be very clear about something this morning. That passage really has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with him having stuff. What it has to do is with what has him. Because the stuff, it could, you know, you put anything you want to there. It could be money. It could be other stuff. It could be other. It could be your house. It could be a boat. It, it, it could be a relationship with your with your spouse. It could be your kids. But whatever has priority, whatever is the most important thing, if it has you, then Jesus doesn't. I love verse 21. The reason I love it out of Mark is verse 21 because it says Jesus looked at the young man and he loved him. And, and I just, I, I, I need to be reminded of this and I need to remind you this morning that Jesus sees you this morning and he looks on you with love. His love is greater than the depths of your sin. This morning, even though he, he sees you, he knows you, he loves you, we've got to be reminded of that at times. This morning, just take that as a reminder, no matter what you're walking through right now, what you're dealing with or what you're facing, Jesus loves you. But there is this idea that has, that has permeated Unfortunately, even the church in places. See, we, we love the idea of Jesus as our Savior, don't we? How many of you are grateful that Jesus has saved you? Anybody? How many of you look back to, look back to what your life was like before Jesus, and you look at that and you're like, thank you, God, for rescuing me from that, right? We're grateful for that. I mean, we love that. We love that, we, you know, again, this guy was saying, God, I want life now and, and forever. And Jesus said, cool, I've got that for you. I've got that for you. But there's a problem. Jesus isn't just Savior. In fact, a lot of times what we read in Scripture, we read these two terms together. He's Savior and Lord, we like the Savior part, because that feels good. But Lord is a little bit uncomfortable. Now, we don't use Lord very often unless you're watching Downton Abbey or some other British show, like my Lord and my lady. You know, we, don't, we don't really use that term, but I wanted to define this for us today. So on the screen, you see this. Lord is someone or something having power, authority, or influence. It's a master or a ruler. Like, I get goosebumps when I think about the fact that Jesus died to save me. I don't like this one, though. Because, again, I've said it the last couple weeks, I like my way and my ideas. I've got good ideas, I think, sometimes anyways. The path that I've got written, you know, laid out, I think it's a good one. But here's what you and I have to remember. It's not either Savior or Lord. It's both Savior and Lord. As a follower of Jesus, 
we're not in charge. There's that scripture, I think you've probably, I've, I've said it before, but what we read about at the end of, the, at the end of days that, that every knee will, what? Bow. Why do we bow? We bow to someone who is greater than we are. We bow our will and our wants and our desires and say, not my will. Jesus did the same thing, didn't he? In the garden, in, in the garden of Gethsemane, as he, as he waited that night before, he, he knew his death was coming. He knew it would be painful. And yet he made a statement and declared, not my will, but yours. And unfortunately, too often for most of us, if we are just honest and we strip everything away, we're good with Jesus being Savior, but we don't always follow through on him being Lord because it's not comfortable. And yet, as a follower of Jesus, as someone who said yes to follow him, we don't have an option. Probably some of us, if we sat back and thought about it, if we don't feel like we are filled with joy this morning, if we look at what's going on in our lives, there are probably some areas that we're holding back and saying, no, Jesus, you can't have that. You can't have my attitude. You can't have this. They deserve what I've said to them. They deserve, they should, they should get what they deserve. And Jesus said, but Parker, are you getting what you deserve? Follow Jesus means to bow my knee because he's both Savior and he's Lord. He's the boss. He's in, he's in charge. You've probably heard the statement before. But some have said that the distance between heaven and hell is 18 inches. I say that because we know what we're supposed to do up here, but we never surrendered this. And Jesus, again, a rich young ruler who had, uh, as we read, I mean, and, and maybe he was telling, even if he was telling most of the truth, I've, I've kept all of those commandments. And Jesus said, all right. But here's the thing, you have to be all in. And he wasn't. And some of us don't feel or don't sense joy in our lives because we've missed this simple but difficult truth that obedience leads to joy. If you look back at verse 12, Paul says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it's even more important. Like a dad telling his kids, Hey, I'm about to leave the house. Act right. Do what you're supposed to do. But the second part of the verse there, Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. In the NIV and other translations, it says, work out your faith with fear and trembling. And when we, when we read that, or when we hear that, at times it can say, wait, I thought we were saved by faith, not by works. And I love the nuance here and the way it shows in, 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 in this because Paul, Paul writes this here, work hard to show the results of your salvation. In, in other words, it's, it's not just about um, uh, making a decision or, or praying a prayer. I think we in the church have done a disservice to people in a lot of ways. Because if you've been in church for a while, uh, you, you've heard, and I've even prayed this, and I've prayed it since I've been here, and we've taken that moment to say, you know, at the end of service, hey, are you following Jesus the way that you should? Have you made him Lord or, or, or boss of your life? If not, you know, then, then, let's, then today is your opportunity to do that. And, and, that's, and that's incredible, but here's what we have to understand. 
that's not the end line. That's not the finish line. That's the starting line. Making a decision to follow Jesus is where it begins. There's, that, there's, a, there's another word that we read, uh, we, we talk, I and mean, I'm sure you've, you've had multiple conversations at work uh, about this word, the word sanctification. Don't you guys talk about that at work all the time? <laughs> Every day, yeah. No, um, <laughs> sanctification is, is the process of learning to live more and more in line with your identity in Christ. In other words, you've made a decision to follow Jesus, Awesome. But that's, there's, that, there's that word right there, follow Jesus. It's not you made a decision to pray a prayer and then you keep doing things the way you want to. It's following Jesus. Sanctification is this process of learning to put my wants and my will aside so that I can come in line with who Jesus is and what he wants in my life. It, it's asking these questions. It, if the tomb is empty, which we believe, and the kingdom of God is coming, which, which we believe, and my sin is forgiven, and, and the spirit of God lives inside of me, then what today will be different about me than it was yesterday? It, it, it's asking how will my relationships look differently now that Jesus is, is in charge? Amen. It's how will I spend my time and my money now that I recognize that I'm not in charge, but, but he is? How, how will I parent my kids? How will I work not for my own good, but for his glory. And Paul goes on in that verse and he says, he says obeying God in, at the end of verse 12 with deep reverence and fear. And I think a lot of times when we read that, and maybe I'm just talking to myself and so, so you can just say, yeah, we've all figured that one out, Parker. But I read that and I think about the idea, this, the fear of the Lord. And it's like, okay, am I supposed to be scared of this guy? Am I supposed to live in such a way that, that I'm afraid that he's going to like strike me dead if I mess up? Because I feel like sometimes that's, that is the place that I live from. Okay, I better not mess up today because if I do, then God's going God's gonna to end me. You know, that's, that's sometimes the way that, that I feel or the way that we act, we do it out of a place of fear. And I think sometimes it, we do that because of Maybe the, the bosses that we've had in the past. Anybody in there ever had a bad boss before? I can see by most of your faces that you have. <laughs> Think about a minute. What was bad? I mean, some of those boss, like they're they're mean. They 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 speak to you in ways that you shouldn't speak to, and they're disrespectful. It seems like they're just trying to get you fired. We, we, we come to work kind of in fear, like, okay, what can I do so that I can avoid that person? What can I do so I don't have to interact so that they won't try and get rid of me? And how unfortunate is that we have a tendency to view God through that same lens, That, that's what it is about being Lord, being in charge, being the boss. And I think too often we live from a place or, or we've transferred our thoughts of that boss to a good God. How many of you worked for a good boss before? I mean, a good boss, you'll, you'll, you'll run through a wall for him, won't you? You'll, you'll do things for them that you, that you wouldn't normally do because you love to see you, you, the way they make you feel. You feel empowered. You feel like you can do your job, that they've got your back. What would happen if we, if we lived under that same mindset of the God that we serve about him being our Lord? Living in fear and reverence 
It's living out from a place of respect, knowing that, recognizing that God isn't just some guy in the sky who, who's just looking to, to off me when I do wrong. Because if that was the case, I'd have been gone a long time ago. But I also think about this idea when, when again, like I said, a good boss or even a good, a good parent. Like uh, when I remember, I love seeing um, the look on my dad's face when I've done something that pleases him. You know what I mean? Like it brings joy to him. What changes when we live under the lordship of Jesus from that perspective? Because then I'm not living from a place of fear that God's just trying to get rid of me, but that God loves me so much that he was willing to send his son to die for me. And that even there are going to be times where I'm going to mess up, but God's not saying, okay, three strikes and you're out. He says, no, 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 there's another strike. Okay, I get it, but I love you. And he sees me not just for what, for what I am. He doesn't just see me where I am. He sees me also for what could be because he sees Jesus in me. I, I'm the eternal optimist. If you haven't figured that out yet, you will. I wear lime, lemon shirts. I mean, come on. No, but I always see the glass is half full. I always want to see things and believe the best about people, believe the best for you. I want to see God do great things in your life because I know he is able, according to scripture, the Bible says he is able to do what? Exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we could ask, hope, or imagine. I got a big imagination, we also read that Jesus said, it's written in the Gospel of John, that Jesus came to suck the life out of you, didn't he? No, it says he came for that, that you might have life to the full. That's what Jesus wants for you. That's what happens, what? When we live in obedience. When we live from a place, not of rebellion, saying my way or the highway, but saying, God, your way. God, I want to live from this, from this place. I love this in, in Zephaniah in the Old Testament, verse, chapter three, verse 17. It says, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take the light in your in you with gladness with his love he will calm all your fears he will rejoice over you with joyful songs does that sound like some evil overlord to you no in fact other translations say that he dances over you he sings over you i think back to when 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 my kids were babies and i'd hold them in my arms at night and singing over them to calm their to calm them down before they would go to bed and can you see can you hear can you feel this morning that God isn't just up there angry at you but he loves you and he sings over you To me, that changes the perspective of why I live from a place of obedience. Not because God is trying to get rid of me, but because God loves me and he wants the best. He wants the best for you. The big so what? Again, obedience today leads to joy. I don't obey God to keep him off my back. I obey God to bring joy to him and joy to my life. I mean, going back again to the beginning of the message today about our kids and their actions. I love when I would pick Jackson up from a friend's house and their parents would say something like, you guys have raised a good kid. And I'm like, well, I'm glad that he acted that way for you because when he get him, it. <clears throat> or times when, when Sadie's friend would, her, her parents would invite Sadie to go on vacation with their family. Why? Because she wasn't trouble, but she was, she was a good kid. It just, again, as a parent, as a dad, it's like, oh, you can breathe a sigh of relief because you, because you see and you recognize. And Sadie didn't just act right because I, I threatened her life. She acted right because she knew that it would also bring joy to her life and it bring joy to us too. Because obedience leads to joy. Look at verse 13 of the chapter. It says, for God is working in you, doing what he's giving you, the desire and the power to do what, to do what pleases him. So obedience leads to joy in my life, but it also leads to God's pleasure. 
when you look at, the, again, the dictionary, one of the words or one of the definitions of pleasure is joy. And he doesn't say, figure it out on your own, kid. According to what Paul wrote here, he gives us the desire and the power. Does it mean it's easy? Nothing in scripture said following Jesus is going to be easy, does it? But he gives, us the, he gives us the desire and the power because obedience leads to joy. It leads to joy for me. It leads to God's joy. That's what the verse says. It brings pleasure. His delight, his pleasure, his joy comes from us living the lives. He gives us the power to live. Verse 14 and 15, we go on. Do everything without complaining and arguing. I think I probably could have done a whole sermon series just off those like six words right there. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that what? So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Um, I have not seen an official study on this, but I have a feeling, my own personal opinion, if we removed all the complaining and arguing from Facebook. <laughs> exactly. However many friends you got, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. You could probably see all three thousand friends' lives and what's going on in their life in about five minutes if all of the complaining and the arguing was gone. And you know what's crazy? The majority of people on my feed, my friends list, all however many of them there are, they're all people that I met through church. And yet most of what, it seems like they must have missed this verse or maybe, maybe they scratched it out and said, I don't like that when I'm taking it out. But Paul says here, do everything without complaining and arguing. And yet... Most of what is happening around us, most of what's happening on social media and everywhere else is he's wrong, she said this, he did that, yada, 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 complaining and arguing about things that really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. And yet we wonder at times why people aren't drawn to the Lord. Because unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of difference in our words or actions than in people who don't claim to live for the Lord. Now again, it's probably other churches, it's not Southside. I'm speaking for them this morning. But Paul says there, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. When we live counter culture, against culture, different than the world, what does Paul say? He says, we shine bright like a diamond. I'm just kidding. But we shine bright. And the message Eugene Peterson says that we bring out the God colors in the world. If people aren't seeing something different in me than in what they see in people who don't claim to be a follower of Jesus, it's quite possible that I've missed this simple idea. Joy doesn't come from getting my way. Joy comes from following His. Obedience leads to joy. Where do we find joy? Is it from the temporary or the momentary? No, it's from the deep knowledge and living that comes from knowing that Jesus died for us and was raised to new life and that he provides a way for life for you and for me both now and forever. Do we think that living the same lives as the people around us, the same negative, the negative, you know, complaining lives, do, you, do we think that will point people to Jesus? And the answer really should be no. 
Does, does it mean that if I stop arguing tomorrow, that all of a sudden tomorrow it's going to change somebody's life and they're going to give their life to the Lord? Maybe not. It could happen. But like I said, there are thousands and thousands and probably millions of people on social media who have a Bible verse under their name or their handle or who, have, who claim to be a follower of Jesus who don't live any differently. And so people are looking at them saying, well, what's different with them? Why should I follow God if your life is more miserable than mine is? They need to see an example, a perpetual example in your life and in mine where we work and in the way that we parent and the way that we love people and the way that we prefer others over ourselves and the way that we obey the Bible obey Jesus and what his teaching for us, when they see that, then it begins to point to something different in your life. And it begins to allow people to see that, hey, there is something there. So it was, so obedience leads to joy for me. It leads to God's pleasure, but it can also lead to the world encountering the real true reason for joy, can it? Jesus. And then he goes on in verse 16. It says, hold firmly to the word of life, and on the day of Christ's return, I'll be proud that I did not run the race in vain, and that my work was not useless, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service as an offering to God. And I want all of you to share in what? Joy. Yeah, you should rejoice and I will share your joy. Uh, this year, from what I understand, um, Southside celebrates 60th, a 60th year of serving the community, serving here, of being a church and being a body here in Savannah. And that's incredible. Some incredible men have pastored this church, haven't they? People who have been very formative in your lives. You know, I'm excited for Pastor Jack to be back in a few weeks. I mean, he's pastored this church for more than 30 years. Many of you, uh, you gave your life to the Lord or you've you continued following Jesus. And can I tell you something? He's excited to celebrate with us that the debt's paid off. But that's not the thing that brings him the most encouragement. He's excited. He'll be excited to see people showing up for service faithfully on that Sunday morning. But, but that's, that's not the real testament that he sees. He, he's excited to see people give faithfully. But, but, but you know what speaks even louder? It's when men and women who are here today and those who are in other churches today, other cities today, continue to live their lives for Jesus even when Pastor Jack's not there. Because like Paul says, hey, get it. When I was with you, it was easy, but I'm not with you anymore. But just because I'm not there doesn't mean that it gives you the right to walk away from the Lord. He says, I need you to remember that what leads to joy is not showing up to church faithfully or, 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 or not just not saying things you shouldn't say, but it is obeying the Lord in every area of your life. You want, me, you, want, you want me to feel joy? Obey God. Paul didn't say, hey, I have joy right now because I am imprisoned and I just love it. He didn't say, he didn't write to him and say, listen, I will be so joy filled because of the guard that I am chained to 24 hours a day. He said, no, I'll know that my life wasn't wasted and wasn't run in vain when you continue to live a life obedient, not to me, but to God. Because when you do that, it brings joy into your life and to mine. It brings joy to the heart of the Father. It brings joy to people around us. Why? Because they can see the God colors through us and that can draw them to the Father. And it will bring joy to those who have gone before us. Because again, they recognize their lives were not lived in vain. Obedience leads to joy. Obedience leads to joy. Uh, think about it for a moment. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the, uh, 
the expert on flying kites. Anybody ever flown kites before? Have you ever done that? It can be fun. It can also, as, of a, as a parent, it can be really frustrating when there's no wind and you're trying to help your kid get that kite up, up in the air, right? But imagine with me this morning, flying a kite. It's a windy day. Soars gracefully, right? Dances with the wind. Its tail just kind of fluttering behind it. All words that I made up on my own. I'm just kidding. But the kite experiences the joy of freedom and moving higher and higher into the sky. But the freedom isn't without restraint. The kite, it's held by a string or controlled by a hand or the person on the ground. Now, picture what would happen if the kite suddenly decided that the string was just holding it back. It might think, well, if I could only break free from this string, then I could really soar. But we all know from experience that when we let go of the string, the kite might fly for a little bit, but what eventually it comes crashing down, plummets to the ground. The very thing that seems to be restricting its freedom is actually what's allowing it to experience the joy of flight. I think in the same way our obedience to God might feel like a restriction to some. We, maybe you think, I, if I could just do things my way, then I would be really happy. But just as that kite needs the string so it can stay afloat in the sky, we have to remain connected to God to experience true joy. Jesus said in John 15, 10 and 11, says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy would be complete true joy comes from being tethered to or obeying God's commands. It's in our obedience that we find the freedom to live fully and the joy that comes from knowing we are His. Would you stand with me this morning? I love to be reminded of that verse that Jesus came to give me life and life to the fullest. Amen. That abundant life. But an abundant life isn't found just in doing things my way. It's about just as Jesus found saying, hey, your will, not mine. Maybe some of the joy we feel is missing in our lives today isn't because God hasn't been faithful. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's because we haven't been. Jesus is the way maker. He is a miracle working God. He is able to do more in you and through you than you think possible. But those things happen when we are fully obedient or submitted, not to a church or to an idea, but to the Father. And so this morning, we're going to sing that song again, Waymaker. 
And we're going to take a moment just to worship together. And as I prayed earlier, maybe this morning, maybe, maybe there is something going on in your life right now. Maybe you're facing something difficult, something beyond what you can handle on your own. Maybe, maybe you feel like, man, I've been struggling in this area and I need God to make a way. Maybe this morning, just maybe, it starts not by simply by singing, but it's saying, God, okay, if you give me the desire and the power to live for you, then God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to keep the command. I'm going to do what you say. So as we sing this morning, I want to invite you to create a place, whether that be coming here to the front or right there in your seat and just in your own words saying to the Lord, God, help me to be obedient this week. Help me to not just know what it means to follow you here, but to live from that place right here. I may not see it and I may not feel it right now, but God, I know that you're at work. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads this morning? Maybe this morning, maybe, maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never bowed your knee. You never said, Jesus, I want you to be in charge of my life. Maybe, maybe you've, you've come to church. Maybe you've said that you've, you know, you've sung the songs and, you, and you've prayed different times, but you've never, and maybe you've even prayed and said, God save me, but you've never given him the authority to, to, to bring change in your life. You've never obeyed to that level. And maybe today is your day. Maybe you're saying, Pastor Parker, I want to, I want to take that step. I want to I want to begin that journey. I, I want to be obedient, not to a church, but to God. Maybe this morning that's you. And you said, Pastor Parker, would you pray for me? I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. If that's you, would you simply raise your hand this morning so I can know who I'm praying for and praying with today? Is there anybody this morning that would say, would you pray with me? that I would trust him fully. Let's pray together this morning. God, we thank you that we can trust you, that you're a good God. Help us not to view you through the lens of bad bosses or others that we've seen, but help us to view you through the lens of a good God who loves us, who takes delight in us, who sings over us, who, who calms our fears, who, who wants us to live a life of abundance, a full life as we live obedient to your word today, Jesus. Help us today, God, to trust you, not just say it, but to do it. We thank you for it today, Father. So your name we pray this morning. So this morning, my prayer for you, my prayer over you this morning is that yes, God would be the one who would make a way, but that you would walk this week in obedience to the Lord. That as you do, that he would give you the desire and the power to live a life fully submitted and obedient to him. That as you do that, you will experience joy, that you will bring joy to the heart of the Father, and that other Others this week would experience life and joy because of what they see in you. May you bring out the God colors in the world that others might experience joy found only in Jesus. Why? Because he is at work. Whether you see it or whether you feel it, he is working in you and through you. And as you and I live obedient to him, we will experience joy and joy full in our lives. You received that this morning? Amen. This morning, let's continue to sing that God is our way maker. Let's let, hey, let somebody know this week. 
When you're out and when you're talking to somebody, talk and let them know what God's done for you, what he's done in your life. Because as they hear your testimony, they'll experience joy in their life. And we'll begin to see men and women and teenagers and kids experience the full life and joy found only in Jesus. Amen? Well, listen, I hope you have a great Sunday. And I hope we'll see you back at 630 on Wednesday for family night. Have a great week. Be blessed. Stay dry. And we'll see you on Wednesday. Have a great day.